very much. I'm being amplified, right? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so for those of you who are wondering why Karen is so short, no, I'm actually not. I'm Doris Talk, and um, yes, there was a schedule change, which I'm very grateful for because it made it possible, it made it possible for me to be here. So uh, for those of you who are wondering why a 13-year-old is speaking to you, you're going to find out pretty soon. Uh, I'm not going to expand on the introduction, so you should see some information throughout the speech. Um, but before I launch into talking about my generation, I want to issue a quick note of warning. Uh, although I have a lot in common with my plugged-in peers, I mean, I'm on a smartphone, I, uh, always, I'm, I'm always on my computer, I'm also a devoted public radio listener, <laughs> which um, might set me apart a little bit. Some of my favorites are actually imported from Canada, so I love the CBC um, wiretap with uh, Jonathan Goldstein, Final Cafe with Stuart McLean. Are there any CBC fans here? Ooh. Yay! <laughs> I don't feel like the only radio listener in the world. Um, that's, uh, yeah, I love, uh, actually Canadian stuff gets imported a lot. Um, you might be used to American stuff being imported to Canada, but I love listening to Canadian radio programs. I prefer physical books to e-books most of the time, the blasphemy of it, and I also watch nightly newscast every day at 5.30 p.m. at a conference where everybody's been talking about how they don't watch TV anymore. And I know that the audience for the newscast I watch is definitely a lot older than me, a good sign is when you're watching the ads and they're all for retirement investment and gout and osteoporosis drugs. <laughs> then again, if I were exactly like a lot of my peers, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. So I'm happy that uh, there are some little things that set me apart. This speech is called Talking About My Generation. But in many ways, it is hard to fit the teenagers and tweens of 2011 into one concrete box. So I decided to focus on the one thing which is probably fairly easy that ties us together, whether we're in Redmond, Washington State in the US, where I come from, or Richmond Hill, Ontario. Teenagers around the developed world seem to be constantly using technology. In any developed country, we have hundreds, if not thousands, and millions of billions of channels of entertainment and education, whether on TV or radio or YouTube uh, online. And young people like me are embracing the freedom to watch whatever we want, really whenever we want. Take a look at this timeline that shows how two hypothetical kids, Catherine and Edward, might have consumed entertainment or uh, entertained themselves differently over time. So in the good old 1200s, knights and peasants and other stuff, <laughs> then they're maybe foraging for blackberries or making bread. I just thought that's what they would do in the 1200s. In the 1800s, uh, probably they're reading some children's books. In the 1900s, listening to the Children's Hour on the BBC. 1960s, watching the family's brand new color TV. 1980s, uh, watching recorded programs on a VCR. And good old 2011, uh, joining together to watch YouTube videos together, particularly some of the ones their friends have recommended, like, uh, has anyone here seen the, I don't know, this is maybe more an American thing, the ticklish penguin at the Cincinnati Zoo. Has anyone seen the ticklish penguin video? Okay, look that up, it's really funny. It's a penguin that makes this uh, abnormal noise when it's being tickled. It's much better than it sounds. Or maybe they're watching YouTube comedians or uh, parodies of music videos. So while Catherine and Edward are obviously hypothetical children, I think that the scenarios which I've depicted here are fairly realistic for their time periods. I want to take an informal poll of the audience here and see what your media consumption experience is like. I know you're not quite in my generation, but where would you say you get most of your news? Raise your hand if you get most of your news from TV. Okay, I see some raised hands. Raise your hand if you get most of your news from radio. A couple raised hands, that's impressive. Raise your hand if you get most of your news from print publications like magazines and newspapers. Okay, and raise your hand if you get most of your news from internet news sites. Majority. So for those of you who are, you know, always going to um, the internet in order to check news, I, I'm always, this is kind of a weakness of mine, whenever I am, whenever I finish checking my email, finish doing schoolwork, especially during the summer, I always go to like HuffingtonPost.com or CNN.com every five minutes, it's sort of like a twitch, <laughs> and, uh, sorry, and so I get a lot of my news from the internet, as do you. What about non-news entertainment? TV? Radio? Uh, print publications, internet, okay, again, internet's pretty dominant. So um, for those of you who raise your hand and say internet, um, how on the internet do you get, because I know the internet is a huge sort of domain here, where on the internet do you get your entertainment? Does anyone want to just throw out some stuff? Downloads. Downloads, okay, what else? Torrents. 
Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> that was my code. <laughs> I, I think, um, so for me, for my family, we get a lot of, we actually watch a lot of television programs, not on TV, but on the internet. Um, I will confess that I watched two movies probably illegally off of a sketchy Chinese site. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, this doesn't make me seem suddenly like a disreputable person, and I do have this in common with at least some of you. And uh, we also go online, obviously, for news and other kinds of things. But um, entertainment is definitely what my sister and I, we will go to YouTube, and we're going to be talking a little bit about that with uh, kind of profiling my sister. But when you think about content these days, it seems like you have to be either really good or really bad in order to get a sizable number of views. Uh, and that's something that I, on TV too, and that's something that I've been a little bit frustrated by, is that you see either some really, really good content has like 400 million views, or some really bad content uh, has an equal number. So my, uh, the modern teenager's viewing experience tends to be a mishmash. We're not just tuning into TV to get you know, our two hours of entertainment. It really comes from all different sources, videos people share on Facebook, emails, YouTube. My older sister, Adriana, is a great example. This is a bad picture of her. She'd probably tell me, but she's not here, so I get to show that. She often laments, you know, we never watch TV anymore. And I think that that's partially true, because when we have free time on a Saturday night, what we're doing is not instantly going to the television and turning it on. We have uh, eight computers, three phones, and one iPad, so from a purely numbers game, it definitely outranks TV. We subscribe to Netflix, and we watch videos on streaming sites like Hulu and Tudo, that sketchy Chinese site I told you about. Mm -hmm. Having so many choices, I would say, spoils us a little bit, because we're used to getting what we want, and it gives us more power to customize our viewing experience. We kind of put together our program of channels and shows. When teenagers do tune into television programming, it's often for shows that we can control using texts or votes, like American Idol, for instance. One of my sister's favorite TV shows is the musical drama comedy Glee. Have any of you seen Glee before? It's a little bit young for you guys. Um, but Glee is uh, her favorite show. She's a big fan of like singing and high school dramas and stuff. So she watches Glee episodes on the streaming site Hulu while she's exercising on the stationery bike, which is a weird image. And one of her favorite <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's she's like, and one of her favorite musicians is Lady Gaga, not a taste I share, but she'll always open up YouTube to see Lady Gaga's newest perplexing movie, music video when it comes out. She doesn't tune into MTV, she doesn't buy a CD, wow, that rhymes, she doesn't um, really have to pay anything, uh, turn on the radio, she just looks it up on YouTube and plays it to the highest volume purposefully to annoy me. Additionally, Adriana watches a lot of YouTube comedians. Um, have any of you seen any of these people? Raise your hand if you've seen at least one of them. You can look down the list. I'm seeing some raised hands. So people like uh, Bub's Beauty and Bub Yosti, uh, or channels, Niga Higa, Niga TV, Community Channel, Kevin Jumbo, Chester C. These are more popular with like my sister's age group, so 15 up. Uh, I watch it a lot too. And the, these are just the YouTube comedians that we're semi-loyal to. So we've either subscribed or we're going to type in their channels when we really want to get our entertainment fix for the day. And we also watch plenty of viral videos. I noticed that unlike the YouTube comedians who upload regularly, like every week or every month, then the popularity of viral videos tends to be extraordinarily random. Raise your hand if you've seen Charlie bit my finger. Okay, I've seen some raised hands. Any of you are at the YouTube session, I know you saw it. What about uh, Susan Boyle on Britain's Got Talent? Okay, this is a pretty tuned in viral video. So please, uh, David after the dentist. Okay, I've seen some raised hands. That one's crazy. Rebecca Black's Friday. Oh, good. That means I can spare you the torture of playing it. But I'm going to, uh, I'm going to give you a great gift, which is my rendition. Friday. Okay, no, I won't do that. <laughs> what I mean by the popularity of these videos being random is in your head, I want you to have the mental image or the soundtrack of Susan Boyle and Rebecca Black and compare those. I mean, one is in one direction and one is in another. And it's difficult to get attention, it seems like, on YouTube for being in the middle when we have so many billions of videos to watch. So you either have to be really good or really bad. But the problem is too many people are heading into the really bad direction, not just on YouTube, but also on TV. I heard there were plans in Canada for a Jersey Shore copycat called Lake Shore, which thankfully, uh, that's not being aired, is it? No. Okay, it was just in plans. Did they, okay, so I heard, and you can confirm me if this is correct, I was just looking this up, um, that they managed to get like the 
worst person out of every single ethnic group and therefore offend everybody. Okay, that's uh, that's pretty sad. You know, I guess this is like you know, Canadians are into diversity and everything, but we at least only offend Italian Americans. <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's kind of sad. Okay, well, well, you might be wondering why am I complaining about Jersey Shore so much? She's not even old enough to watch it. I don't have MTV, and I have uh, I only saw an episode of Jersey Shore once when I was at a hotel. I did not stay for the entire thing. I just saw. Um, Snooki saw a bar fight that she really wanted to join in, and I was like, oh, she <laughs> <laughs> uh, and change the channel. But you might be saying, well, okay, she's 13, she's not watching Jersey Shore, what's her big deal with it? Well, it's become internalized in the popular culture so much that if you ask one of my peers who's Snooki, what's the situation, then they will know who Snooki is and that the situation does not necessarily imply a dire circumstance. Well, yeah, it kind of does. But there are younger teenagers, there are, you know, there are 11, 12 year olds, there, there's I mean, people who are younger than me who tune in to watch the show. Uh, because, you know, they're just big fans of this and lifestyle or watch it online. So while Jersey Shore might not be aimed at us, it's uh, definitely true that we are being marketed content that doesn't set high expectations. Look at what's being covered in your average issue of Seventeen or Cosmo Girl. You can see the headlines there. Um, nothing particularly intelligent. It's all about appearance and celebrities and how to get the great haircut. And that's... Um, that's what a lot of teenagers consume, or a lot of teenage girls, anyway. And walk into the teen or kids section of your average department store. For those of you who have never really had the occasion to do this, I uh, highly encourage you, next time you go shopping, walk into the teen or kids area, and you'll notice that something has changed. Not only are all the clothes sizes smaller, but also the music has gone from being, whatever, like relaxing or something, to high-pitched and saccharine, or whining and overly auto-tuned, because that's just what they play in the kids' or teens' department. And I don't know who had the bright idea that fluorescent green pants look better on youngsters than they do on adults, but they don't. That's such a great idea. And uh, my personal pet peeve, Abercrombie and Fitch putting some guy's naked torso on every single bag of overpriced teenage clothing. I'm talking about clothes, I'm talking about magazines, and you might think, well, we're really into the more online content side, but this translates to really all kinds of content whether clothing, or magazines, or television, uh, where Disney, Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, I hope you guys are, actually, that would be cool if you were in the audience, but I have a real problem with the unnecessary evils of superficial plots and stock characters. <clears throat> now, in response to my miniature tirade, you might be thinking, from the point of view of the media professional, who, of course, is responsible for these things, well, we're just creating something that viewers want. Uh, well, that's true that media does respond, that people who create content do respond to what viewers like and uh, what's popular, but at the same time, what we watch defines us as much as they say what you, you are, what you eat. Uh, we are also what we watch, uh, whether that's on YouTube or on TV or what we wear. Whether you're in marketing or music, technology or design, it's important to treat your audience like intelligent people. It doesn't matter if they're 4 or 40. I grew up watching public television and educational ad-free children's shows like Mr. Rogers and Reading Rainbow, who, uh, and, I, and as such, I had this experience, and you know, my parents would always have us talk to their uh, friends who are adults, and we would be watching news with our parents, so we had a kind of interesting childhood in that we weren't, I guess, fed the usual uh, diet of like cartoons and stuff. We, we watched Bugs Bunny occasionally, but we also, we played educational games on the BBC School's website. And so from a very early age, I saw comparing, uh, say, my sister and I and some of my uh, some kids of our family friends to kids that we knew that we, played, that we played with who were really into Pokemon or Cartoon Network or really obsessed about that. And so I witnessed how media content can really influence someone uh, in the choices that they make and what they're interested in. Perhaps one of the most influential ways that technology has had an impact on my generation is in the way that we learn. Suddenly we don't need to wait for a knowledgeable elder to ask, or a trip to the library to check out a book, although obviously we still do that, but I can just turn on a smartphone and find the answer online. You know, if you, you guys are taking a look at smartphones, let's say that I just really need to find the answer to something, I can just, um, so what should I look up? Okay, so pretend that you're a 12 year old and you want to look up something. Let's, I'm gonna time myself to see how fast I can get this. Window. Okay, so I want to look up, uh, here's a question I asked a while back when I had to go to a fancy event. What is smart casual? Mm -hmm. 
so I could just go and say, what is smart casual by name? Okay, what is smart casual? Go and I have it. Smart casual, as distinct from business casual, is a loosely defined dress code. Uh, casual, okay, now I clicked on the link. Uh, casual yet smart, neat, enough to conform to the particular standards of certain Western social groups. As smart casual is not formally defined, the lines between it and other casual styles see Western dress code are often blurred. Okay, uh, think how long that would take me if I had to find someone who knew. So I asked my parents actually when, when the dress code said smart casual on the invite. Uh, then, then I asked my parents and either of them were like, well, okay, I wonder, well, I guess casual is like jeans or stuff, so smart casual is probably like not jeans. So they weren't quite sure. So I decided instead, hey, I'm going to look this up. And that was where I found my answer. So suddenly the internet has become our uh, source for when we want to look something up, we just go there. And it's empowering to have that feeling. Because I remember when I was four and five, I had this real problem with spelling words, right? And Microsoft spell check would not judge me for spelling didn't wrong a hundred times. My parents and my older sister might. So technology is incredibly empowering. I could do research, I could take learning in my own hands, write weekly blog posts on something I'd learned. I could not only take in that learning, I could expand on it and share it with others. More than access to the world's knowledge, though, uh, more than awesome games and on-demand entertainment, technology I've seen is also a great equalizer. Like with my example of how I felt a little disempowered, always having to ask my parents what something meant, now I could just you know, use spell check for the internet. The internet's also allowed people to have wildly successful shows without having to be hired by a TV station, or musicians to become popular, or popular for the wrong reasons perhaps, without being signed by a record label. And relevantly to my generation, it's allowed us to teach our parents and teachers. My mom had a bizarre experience recently, or at least she thought it was bizarre. So she came running with them, she was like, now I know how those people who have younger bosses feel. I was like, what is going on? Well, she had the opportunity to have a Skype chat with these two teenagers. And that in and of itself was not bizarre. She has conversations with weirder people. But these two teenagers had won this $100,000 grant from the Thiel Foundation. Does anyone know what the Thiel Foundation is or does? Well, the Thiel Foundation was founded uh, by Peter Thiel, who is the founder of PayPal and got really rich. And he's giving these grants as a sort of anti-scholarship program. Instead of giving the money for kids to go to college, he's incentivizing them not to go to college and instead develop their ideas. And you can look it up for more information. So my mom was in contact with these two teenagers who had won $100,000 to develop their open education project. And she said it was just so weird. They were so well-spoken and they knew so much more than me. And I was like, yeah, so? Well, our society places, subconsciously or consciously, a whole lot of judgment on people. Initially, when you look at someone, you'll probably think, okay, that's a teenager. And your head will suddenly generate a bunch of ideas based on age, like, oh, they must be in this grade, they probably listen to this kind of music, They're, they probably don't watch that much news, you know. You probably don't think that, like just looking at me, for instance, that does not come to your head, but when you talk to me, I think that that sort of might seep through. Why else do we say things when we see someone who's, you know, a, like a five-year-old expert skateboarder? We might say something like, he's good for his age. I can't skateboard, he's good, he's better than me. I, we don't even need the for his age part. Yet there are plenty of young people doing amazing things. People like Jessica Markowitz, whose charity sends Rwandan girls to school, or Felix Finkbeiner, whose message to stop talking and start planting has led to the planting of millions of trees around the world. I don't think this is good for their age. I think this is just good. <laughs> and I'm not going to expand on this because you can always watch a speech I gave at the TED conference, more on this topic, uh, if you go online. But the common perception of kids as immature irritants or as slackers wearing hoodies and earphones needs some changing. That's why I love the idea of technology playing a role, not just in <coughs> consumption and creation, but also in equalizing, leveling the playing field between the young and the old. Only in our time, I think, could a 8th grader's iPhone game, Bubble Ball, <coughs> knock angry birds from its perch as the most popular free app. An 8th grader's uh, iPhone app. Does anyone have Bubble Ball on their phone? <coughs> I see some raised hands. I have it. Um, so 14-year-old Robert Nay developed the game Bubble Ball, just uh, kind of in his spare time. 
doesn't even look forward to it. Gosh, that's scary. And it's this really addictive game that has 48 levels in the free version, which is impressive. And I dare you to say pretty good for a 14-year-old to that. Because beating Angry Birds, you have to say, would be pretty good for any age. And that's what technology does, not only in business, but at home. In my own home, I've seen a lot of equality happen, I guess, because of technology. And when I was little, I can remember that my parents were just the ultimate authority on absolutely everything. How many of you when you were little thought your parents knew everything? I see a lot of raised hands. So up until a certain point, probably, your parents, your legal guardians, or whoever was the adult in your life, it seemed like they were just all powerful, all knowledgeable. Well, uh, I realized gradually that, yeah, my parents didn't know everything. Kind of started with when my mom uh, wrote a letter to me pretending to be the tooth fairy, and I know she spelled hula hoop wrong. But the, the concept, <laughs> actually, that's how my older sister figured out. She was like, this isn't the tooth fairy. And so that's how I lost my childhood notion. Uh, this was because I was super jealous. I didn't have a tooth out and I really wanted a letter, so that's another story. I learned that my parents also, another uh, kind of disillusionment happened with technology. Not that that's a bad thing, but my dad has always been the, uh, I guess the really like academically knowledgeable person. He has a PhD in physics and he, uh, you know, does tons, he worked for Windows Mobile for a ton of years. And so he, he knows all this stuff. I'm always asking about math and science. But one thing is that my mom and my dad are on pretty much opposite sides of the technology spectrum. So my mom is a second wave adopter. She's not one of the, the, one of the crazy people who camped outside of Mac stores. Did any of you guys camp outside? Okay, good. So maybe you guys are a little further that way because I put you too close. Uh, but she's a second wave adopter. Your average grandparents are probably over there and there's my dad. He didn't want a cell phone. And he, because he said, oh, I have a cell phone at home. I have a cell phone at work. I have a phone at home and I have a phone at work. I don't need one because I shouldn't be talking in the car anyway. And he listens to records and watches reruns of the Benny Hill Show. Do any of you guys know what that is? <laughs> I see some raised hands. Nice. Uh, I watch it only when he turns on. So there's my dad over there. And remember, this is a guy who worked for Windows Mobile and didn't want a cell phone until uh, very recently. So he has a lot of vintage habits. He didn't get Twitter and Facebook uh, immediately once they came out. My mom, on the other hand, set it up. She has. She's gotten multiple warnings from Facebook that she has too many friends. That's how... Oh, and also I joke that there should be a game called The Six Degrees of Joyce Speetalk modeled after Kevin Bacon because she's friends with crazy... She's like friends with Jimmy Wales and Nicholas Negroponte and it's weird how uh, she's like connected to all kinds of people. Um, but then her Twitter also, she, she loves using both those. So you can see that my mom is right there and my dad is kind of over there. We have been encouraging him for the, we've been encouraging him for the longest time. Dad, you need to get Facebook, you need to go to Twitter. He just said he was too busy. So finally, last October, he decided to get a Facebook account. And what's so nice about him being on Facebook is that it's finally given my sister and I the chance to teach him something. Usually it's us asking him the questions, as I mentioned earlier. But now we had to say, hey, Dad, you know, this is how you make a post. Will you stop liking all of my friends' comments? That's kind of weird. <laughs> <laughs> That's more my sister's thing because my dad is really into Facebook now. He's such a quick learner that he's posting and he's being really active and he's liking all these events and various uh, conferences and friending people. So uh, he's he's definitely into it. And I said, well, you know, this is a great example of how students are really helping their parents. That it's no longer where adults are the ultimate authority on everything. Sure, adults know quite a lot of things um, by virtue of having studied and uh, gone through life and everything, but we also can be more intuitive when it comes to certain things. And we also set up a blog for him, and so now he knows how to tweet, blog, play Angry Birds. <laughs> I'm a little too on that. And I highly encourage all of you, if you want to, go to twitter.com slash johnspeetalk and follow him. He only has 13 followers, which is an unlucky number, so I'll get it up there. And uh, you'll know that on his blog, everything he's written has been written with extreme care because he typed it out at 40 words per minute. It's improving. <laughs> now, my experience is by no means unique. This is something that I've seen reflected really everywhere that I've gone. I've asked people, have you? Usually when I speak to an older crowd, I ask, have your, parent, have your kids or have kids in your classroom if I've seen teachers helped you with technology before? But I think you guys, do any of you have experience helping your parents with technology? 
I've seen some raised hands. So you guys are obviously a little bit of a younger crowd than I've ever spoken to. Also one of the most scary because uh, going to a film festival, I knew I was in for a bit of a different audience when I went to the North by Northeast Interactive website and the, one of the volunteers had like three body piercings. That was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell I live in a suburb. <laughs> I've heard from lots of adults who've told them that they've almost been scared by the amount that they've learned from their kids, nieces, or nephews. But one thing that I learned from helping my dad is that it goes by most smoothly when you're not afraid, when you're not uh, worried about, you know, I'm supposed to be the one teaching everything. Now for you guys, you're probably the ones teaching your parents, but you're also in a weird position because how many, how many of you have kids or a kid? I see a couple of raised hands, not too many. Well, for those of you that have kids, I've heard it from a lot of people who have like toddlers or tears, so it's a bit of a different crowd, as I said. But um, when when you look at how your kids use technology, when um, for those of you that have kids or nieces and nephews, uh, do an experiment. Find some random person under five and give them an iPad or an iPhone and see how they play with it and how fast they figure it out. And it may scare you to some extent. I had an experience of uh, with my cousin, which I'll be telling you in a second, but I also teach teachers about technology. Uh, that's my usual audience, which is why you guys are so scary. And what I've seen, <laughs> no, not really. What I've seen when I've talked to teachers is that there's often that fear that, no, adults are supposed to be in the authority position. A lot of teachers I've spoken to have been used to, just like 10 years ago, they were the ones who would stand up in front of the class and say, today class, we're going to learn about the revolutionary thing called word processing. And suddenly now the tables have been turned and that's a little uncomfortable for them. So I give these professional development sessions where I talk to teachers. Oh, how is this is set up and you go on the Google documents, you can put in an assignment and then you can share that with somebody else, another teacher, another student, and you can share it with multiple people and multiple people can make changes to the document or just view it. And so for instance, let's say I want to share my editing activity with my mom, then I can go to share and I can invite you to look at the link to share, you can now send attached. So this is obviously pretty simple, but I do give these talks. So I might be talking to teachers about how to use, uh, say, Microsoft Word to write collaboratively in the classroom, or Google Docs to share something, or video conferencing to bring in content providers. And the teachers that I talked with, initially they might, it might be a little weird hearing from a 13-year-old, but they get over it, and they see that, the, that there's value in asking your students and being open-minded to really reciprocal learning. I heard a speech by an education technology enthusiast named Kevin Honeycutt at an education conference a little while ago where he told the story of how uh, he was in his classroom and he was trying to learn how to edit film and he just stayed up all night, he couldn't figure out the technology, I think it was Final Cut or something, and so he just finally gave up and he brought the technology to the class, the next day the software, and said, guys, I can figure this out, you guys give it your best shot. And one of the students piped up. Yeah, we know you're old, we've got your back, and they figured it out within minutes. <laughs> Capitalizing on this, a Washington State organization called Generation Yes uh, really formalizes this. They have students join grades where they go from class to class helping teachers solve all their technology woes and meet state technology standards at the same time. And some of you might be aware of Google's website, Teach Parents Tech, which was made over the holiday season to help uh, parents or grandparents learn um, through various videos that would be sent by their loving relatives. You might have heard the statistic that IQ scores have gone up over time as the result of living in an enriched environment, not so much because we're just so much smarter, but rather we have more access to education, technology, books, the internet. And something else has gone up over time too, our intuitiveness towards technology. Another experiment that you could try is ask your parents to, like, I don't know, like, Try uh, doing something on the computer, like putting a bug on it, that's evil, but how, see how your parents solve it versus how a 10-year-old solves it, or a 5-year-old might be too young, but when you compare that, it's really shocking to see. Uh, I found that when I'm trying to solve something on my mom's computer, then I can get it done usually a little bit quicker than my dad. And as a 13-year-old, I guess I came sort of late to the technology game since I only started using a computer when I was three, uh, back in the old days of 2000. Mm -hmm. And my cousin Maya, on the other hand, has a completely unfair advantage. She's almost two years old, that's an old picture, and she's surrounded by almost every kind of laptop and phone available, and the effects of that environment show. 
One time we were at a family gathering and we were allowed to play charades and so we, instead of using our brains, of course, we decided to get out the iPad and uh, do an app. And immediately Maya figured out that when somebody new came on, she needed to hit the thing for the next acting prompt, and if we didn't like the prompt, she would hit it. So she was essentially our little aide. And she might have not figured out the acting part. She may not speak a whole lot, or smile for the camera, or use the bathroom on her own, but she sure knows how to use an iPad. So I guess that makes her somewhat hireable. My, maybe not. My mom and I shared a taxi with another North by Northeast speaker, and he was telling a story of how his young son um, um, recognized the iPhone, what it was for, put it to his ear, kind of mimicked talking on the phone, even without really seeing it a lot, and then when he was at his grandmother's house, recognized a rotary phone too. So I guess for those of us who like to hold on to our vintage habits of records and radio and newspapers and 530 news, there is still some hope. <laughs> the internet provides not only equality, in the sense of reciprocal learning, parents and teachers and students learning from each other, but also democracy uh, in business, in the home, and uh, learning around the world, not only in developed nations. Today you can find incredible numbers of lectures online, on iTunes, you can find answers to your questions, get homework help on videos on YouTube or uh, on the App Store. And most famously, some of you might have heard of the Khan Academy if you went to that YouTube session, uh, it has thousands, actually probably more than thousands of videos that have to that deal with everything from science to math to biology to history. And it's gotten praise from Bill Gates and Google alike. I teach students about video conferencing, I teach students about writing by video conferencing almost every day during the school year, and then I videotape and post those sessions online. And what I've noticed is that people are watching them, sending me comments, and it's a whole lot more reciprocal than if I just, uh, you know, went to someone's school, spoke, and didn't hear from them afterwards. So it's actually been really interactive. For those of you who think that Facebook is all about slacking off, it partially is, but it's also about getting help, and it was my sister's survival tool during her ninth grade honors courses. She would chat with her friends, not just to have a good time, but to ask them questions about assignments and to get help. People on Facebook lead kind of double lives, where they're not only posting about where they just went on vacation, but also about the latest homework. And that said, Facebook might have also been the reason my sister had a hard time with time management in the first place, but we can just consider it a double-edged sword. Uh, has anyone heard of Subhata Mitra? Okay, well, look him up. He's, uh, he gave an in interesting speech at TED. He had this thing called the Hole in the Wall Project. So essentially, he just put a computer in a hole in the wall in Hyderabad, India, in an area where poor children who didn't usually get to go to school would congregate. And then he just checked to see, uh, checked after six months to see what they had learned. And he was amazed by the results because these children just wanted to use the computer so desperately that even though their English wasn't very good, and even though some of them had never even seen a computer before, they figured it out, they were manipulating it very easily, they were playing games, they were learning, and they had found out about topics from English to math to molecular biology. No teachers required. And that's real proof of what kids can do with simple tools that, uh, not really anything fancy, but instead of giving up, you also notice that attitude. They didn't give up. They just decided, we're going to teach ourselves English. We're going to you know, go online and find all these learning resources. Uh, whereas you might give a computer to a lot of adults, and maybe you see this with like, your grandparents or something. It's, ah, this is new. I don't really want to try this. It's foreign. I'm not really sure what it is. So technology is more, uh, or especially computers, Facebook, online learning tools, this is more than stuff that spoiled rich kids obviously relatively used to um, get higher grades on our homework, it's also something that can bring great equality to other parts of the world. With social media, activism has gone from being just the reign of movie stars and wealthy business people to grassroots efforts from riffraff like us. Much has been said about Barack Obama's campaign in the US as an example of this, but I see a lot of my peers doing even smaller scale things using the tools that we have at hand. Social activism can start uh, really very young. When you see chats like LOL and OMG, social activism and doing good for the world probably doesn't come to mind immediately. But I've seen great examples from people that I know of how this has worked. Uh, I, was, well, I went to my mom's after school for many years, and one of my classmates was this kid that I did not get along with well. I thought he was a pure incarnation of evil. And a while back, I opened up my, as you know, seven-year-olds, that's what you think of people you don't like, incarnation evil. When I opened up my face, 
like inbox a while back, and I hadn't heard from this person for a little while, I saw something which caught my eye. It's an orphanage fundraiser. I clicked on it, and it turned out that this person, who I thought was pure evil, was doing a triathlon to raise money for Thai children in an orphanage so they could have a clean water source. He was using Facebook to share the names of uh, the, uh, to share the events, solicit donations, and publish a list of names of people who had donated. Simple tools, but big action. My older sister, Adriana, sent out her birthday invites via Facebook, like millions of other people, but she sent out something else as well. A solicitation for donations for Babar Ali, uh, the world's youngest headmaster. He's an Indian student and a teacher who, seeing that other kids have the opportunity to go to school, set up a neighborhood school at the age of nine, which serves kids who are often involved in child labor during the day. One of Adriana's friends said that his sister cried when she read the story, so we raised $100 to send, and it was our small way of making an impact through something that goes on every year, our birthday. We actually got the chance to meet him when we were at the Ink Conference in India, so it was extremely personal for us. Last September, I created an event called TEDx Redmond, and what made TEDx Redmond so unique is that all of our organizers, our speakers, our attendees were under 18. We actually put the adults in the simulcast room because we wanted it to be extremely focused on youth. I'm emceeing the event over there. That was our stage manager, Victoria Bond, and over there is Oliver Eldor on cello. And TEDx Redmond was not just an event by kids for because we really did a lot of work. We wrote to sponsors, called up people. My mom did help calling up some sponsors uh, because I would probably cry if I did too many of that, but uh, too much of that. We benefit from technological tools. We used online ticketing services, we sent out emails, we used social networking, people sent repeated Facebook messages to get all their friends to attend the event. And I'm organizing TEDx Redmond again this year, and my initial call to committee members came in the form of a Facebook message. Not to mention I've tweeted on the TEDx Redmond Twitter account multiple times asking for money from sponsors, uh, and it's not too late. <laughs> you can come and see me if you're interested in supporting youth speaking on impactful topics. Each generation, like mine and at TEDx Redmond, we really uh, covered a lot of the topics that are affecting us. Each generation faces these unique issues. Global warming is one of our biggest ones, and as it becomes more severe, you might have noticed that there are many youth who are standing up, either wearing things that have been produced in a green way or buying sustainable materials, but even on a bigger way, uh, some people are starting movements. One of the most impressive fighters against global warming was a speaker at last year's TEDx Redmond. Alec Lors founded Kids vs. Global Warming, which is an organization that uh, tries to get kids to really stand up against global warming, write to their congresspeople and legislators. And he also did the I Matter March, which got kids to march on their state government er, uh, places and really all around the world. I think there were some in Canada as well. And he got people to lead all these marches about global warming. It was on Facebook, it was on the website, all kinds of social networking used for the outreach. And it shows how kids can use these tools. Before, we might have had to go through television, we might have had to call up the local stations or the national we might have had to take a car trip to every single place and knock on doors and hand out leaflets, but now we can do that without necessarily, um, without having to go through these channels of approval. We can just take a good idea and make it happen. You might think that kids with our famously low attention spans wouldn't enjoy hearing talks about serious issues like education and the environment. Before TEDx Redmond, I was worried that nobody would really want to come. I was thinking maybe we'll get like 50 or 60 people. So I set the threshold at 100, I would raise it, but uh, I eventually raised to 500 in case um, there were more people. I didn't want to deal with the wait list. So the two nights before the event, I checked the ticketing service, and my heart about dropped and rose at the same time because I saw that 500 out of 500 tickets had been uh, collected, they were free, and I later had to raise it to 750. We had 750 people sign up to attend and over 750 people attend. It taught me something else that I mentioned earlier in my speech. <coughs> Instead of creating content based on your assumptions of an audience, I could have said, no, this is an audience that isn't going to go for educational talks. I'm going to get Justin Bieber to come instead. Mm -hmm. If I had done that, we wouldn't have had TEDx Redmond. We would have had this amazing youth dialogue about important issues. So instead of creating content based on your assumptions about an audience, try to create content that you yourself would enjoy watching. You might have noticed that the best kids' books are the ones that you find yourself kind of reading to, to the end to, under the pretense of reading the small children, of course. And I really wanted to have the same attitude about TEDx Redmond. I'm going to make a serious conference that I would want to go to, 
And as it turned out, there were a lot of other kids who wanted to attend a conference made up of their peers and role models. And I think that while not all of you might be starting a conference or you know, making programming for TV, for instance, this really applies to online, to uh, technology, to products, whatever you make, and however it involves us, um, even if it doesn't involve you, when you're making something for an audience of adults, you want to keep that in mind. And if you think, well, this is just something a bunch of overachieving teenagers do in their spare time. This is like a weird little uh, difference in this population. I'm sure regular eight-year-olds will be able to do it. TEDx Kids at Sunderland should be eye-opening. Uh, Thorny Post Primary School in Sunderland, England, gave the TEDx Kids format to a bunch of eight-year-olds. And uh, it was, as the website put it, not a bunch of adults to talk about what kids need, but a bunch of real, live, unpredictable, unfettered kids. While it's a little bit, uh, a little bit sad for me to see my under 18 record shattered by eight year olds, mm -hmm. it's also really uh, heartwarming and I'm like, bring it on. Because the younger that we can get talking about important issues and understanding the problems in the world, and I'm not talking about like really showing graphic videos to seven year olds or anything, but uh, the earlier that we can start this discourse and have a serious conversation, the earlier we can start solving problems. And at this first TEDx conference for the under 10 age group, the third and fourth graders were involved in the nitty gritty details. They were calling up sponsors, they were asking for uh, the license, applying for the license, they were calling up to book the venue, and I mean imagine being the person managing the venue, hi, my name is so-and-so, <laughs> calling from TEDx Kids of Sunderland. Like I mentioned with the examples of the technologically in touch toddlers, these kids have an unfair advantage called going through childhood in the 21st century. I'm telling you to rethink how you reach out to my generation, but you really need to watch out for these kids. So how do you reach out to persnickety people like me? I don't like being talked down to with you know, all kinds of weird advertising gimmicks or superficial plots. I don't like to watch long, boring ads. Uh, and so you might think, well, what are we supposed to do to promote a product or um, make something engaging for this kind of audience? We make content interactive and cause-based. Has anyone here heard of the term cause marketing? See some raised hands, okay. Well, uh, the, the panel I was at yesterday about the black hole of Facebook moving beyond light kind of touched on this, emphasizing the importance of engaging with your audience, potential customers, beyond just getting people to hit like on your Facebook page. And interacting with your audience in a meaningful way is something that can be applied to content creation, how you learn online, and how you work with social media. Just as we don't want to limit the quality of content based on our assumptions about a demographic, we don't have to start out with low expectations and limit audience participation to uh, likes on a page or comments. You can harness the participatory energy of your audience, whether young or old, to do great things for the world. And so many companies have been expanding on this. You see companies that are trying to you know, do sustainable coffee, and I'll be talking more about that, but um, I want to quickly switch tack here. I know that going from great things for the world to the Vancouver riots is a bit bad of a transition, but did anyone here watch the game on TV or anywhere? I am seeing some raised hands on a lot of hockey fans here. We well, probably also heard about the aftermath, which makes it sound like a natural disaster, but I don't know about you, I live about three hours from BC, I live near Seattle, so we drive up to Vancouver sometimes, and these are not the images I usually think of. My hypothesis is that Canadians have spent way too much time being better than Americans in certain aspects, and just had to let it out. <laughs> yeah, but some much needed redemption for Vancouver came in the form of social media. Did any of you see this event, uh, post riot cleanup, let's help Vancouver on Facebook? I see some raised hands. We will also be proud to see that 20,644 people signed up to attend, and that was just when I took the snapshot earlier this afternoon. And today, the upstanding citizens of Vancouver were busy at work showing you what the real people of Vancouver look like. You see how simple tools, we don't have to go and build something or be really complicated with technology here, we're just using existing tools like Facebook to do great things. Uh, in the case of my sister, getting donations to the Indian school or Vancouver uh, citizens going out and helping their city. The perfect union between content creation and marketing and my generation that doesn't talk down, that doesn't force us to sit through long, boring ads, I think can come through something like this. Solving social issues with engaging multi-platform outreach. When I was last in Toronto, I uh, got to be on the CBC's George Strombolopoulos tonight, 
And on the show, I discuss the United Nations World Food Program's Free Rice Initiative, which is uh, basically for each answer you get right on various questions around different things, you donate 10 grains of rice to the World Food Program to help end hunger. You don't have to pay anything, it's all through sponsors. And on the show, George Strombolopoulos asked viewers to join his Free Rice group, and he also posts alerts on Twitter. His group has now raised over 6 million grains of rice for the hungry. And instead of treating Twitter as a competitor for attention spans, instead of saying, I have a TV show, I'm not going to use social networking, uh, George Strong will use Twitter to raise awareness about a good cause and maintain a presence in the audience's lives outside of the time they see him on TV. So you see how something that we've been talking about, you know, nobody watches television anymore, it's going downhill. People who are uh, working through mediums that might not seem popular anymore are maintaining popularity by out reaching out on many different levels, not just on TV, but also on, Twitter, on Facebook through causes. Fittingly, since Pepsi has a presence at North by Northeast, uh, I've been impressed with what Pepsi has been able to do with the Refresh Project. Has anyone heard of Pepsi, the Refresh Project? I'm seeing some raised hands. Well, um, by the way, I'm not being paid by Pepsi. I would love to be paid by Pepsi, but I'm not being paid by Pepsi. <laughs> Even though I just said their name three times. <laughs> Giving grants to good ideas in areas like education, community, and the arts, Pepsi supports all these programs uh, with, uh, well, with financial aid, with the publicity from the website. And I know they'll swear it was out of the goodness of their heart, and I'm sure I believe them. But you also have to agree that cause marketing, or supporting causes with your brand behind it, is pretty good marketing. It's caught on from Starbucks trying to sell sustainable coffee. You'll probably see that they're always talking about, like, you know, this came from Ghana, or this came from South America, or saying where it's from, and it's sustainable. Uh, Tom Shoes from What's to Buy One, Give One Shoe program. There are all these examples of cause marketing, and a lot of people have also been involved in social entrepreneurship, where they actually start the company and sell the goods with the sheer purpose of trying to do good. But for those uh, profit based businesses, I don't mind advertising if we can make the world a better place in the process. And that's what I see happening on a bigger and bigger level. Cause marketing has gone really more mainstream now if you see with the environmental products and things that are sustainable. And as far as getting a positive image for your brand, I'll say this. It sure beats, oops, um, I was going down to image, actually I'm grateful I don't. It sure beats Abercrombie and Fitch's naked torsos on the back. I don't know how anyone thought that was a good image. Ultimately, it just isn't the world of children should be seen and not heard anymore. That's very Victorian, and yet it's the attitude that I see a lot of companies having. Whether it's television programming that doesn't reflect real uh, teenage culture and ideas, or if it's clothing that's overly expensive and not produced in a sustainable way, or even um, like drink companies that aren't doing a project to give out to the community, um, we really are a big section of who consumes content. We watch videos, we buy clothing, um, and tune into programming. And we're not just media consumers, we're creators. A bunch of the YouTube comedians that I showed were in their 20s or even their teens. With new technologies in the form of social media and mobile advancement, we're making our voices heard on a multitude of channels. You'll go to websites and they'll be highlighting youth who have started charities, who have been involved in sports, who are doing nonprofit and business work. If there's one thing that you walk away with, I hope it's this, that my peers and me were more than rolled eyes, hoodies, and earphones. With the internet, our phones, and our tablets, we're actively customizing our viewing experience, creating and sharing content, learning online, starting movements, and speaking up. The ways that you reach out to us show what you think of my generation. And it's the way we respond that shows what we think of you. Thank you.